Good morning, Icon Church. How are we doing this morning? All right, you guys are way more alive than first service was, so I give you kudos for that. Uh, my name is Benji. I am the creative arts pastor here at Icon Church, and Dan and Kelly and the family, they're all uh, on vacation today. So uh, we're excited for them and the next couple weeks for them to get away, but I'm excited to be speaking this morning. And, and a few months ago, when we looked at this Sunday and it got scheduled and got put uh, down, that, I was starting to think, what do I want to talk about? Because actually this sermon, this service, this talk doesn't fall in any service or in any sermon series. And so I was like, well, what do I want to talk about? And so there's this idea of being the greatest, the greatest. And so to really illustrate this, I want to jump in this morning and just tell you a story, tell you a story. And so... uh, you got to imagine little Benji for a little while, okay? So me, when I was a little kid, I don't know about you, but how many sports fans do we have in the room today? We got some sports fans? Okay. Now, uh, here were the teams that I was cheering for growing up. In, in basketball, I was a Los Angeles Lakers fan. You can boo. It's okay. I know. We're in Spurs Nation. Okay. Uh, in football, I was a Denver Broncos fan. Yay! Yeah. In baseball, I was a Chicago Cubs fan, and in hockey, I was a Tampa Bay Lightning fan. And when you hear those teams, you think, Benji, you are a confused kid. And to that, I would say, absolutely. Like, I like teams from all across America, and here's why. is because I grew up overseas, and uh, my parents were missionaries and pastors of a, a church over in Kenya. And so growing up, we only got games of teams that were winning. So what that means is when I was young, John Elway and Terrell Davis and Shannon Sharp, they were tearing it up in football. So I got to see all their games. And in basketball, the Lakers were incredible. They were a dynasty. And so I got to see all their games. Became a huge Kobe fan. The Tampa Bay Lightning had a couple good games in there. And the Chicago Cubs are literally not just lovable losers in America, but everywhere across the globe. So the whole planet was cheering for the Cubs to win. And when they finally did last year, I guarantee you parties erupted on every continent. Okay? So that's how I... I grew up. But now, in Kenya, there's a small time difference between Kenya and America. And by small, I mean huge. 9 to 11 hours, to be exact. So what that means is, in order for me to be a sports fan growing up, it took a lot of effort. It meant that I had to wake up at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning before I went off to school to watch these games. And I was invested. So I was going to wake up early. I was going to watch these games. And I remember one morning in particular, May 13th, 2004. I wake up early. I run downstairs. I turn on the TV. I get super excited because the basketball playoffs had started. It was the Western Conference semifinals and the San Antonio Antonio Spurs were playing the Los Angeles Lakers. The series was tied 2-2 for sports fans in the room. That means game five, extremely vital, right? Oftentimes, the winner of game five goes on to win the series. And I knew that. And I'm thinking, man, Kobe's got to show up. Shaq's got to show up. And so I get excited. And this game's being played in San Antonio. And on this particular game, I felt good about our chances, right? We're up 16 at one point. But then, like the Spurs always do, They start to climb back into the game. And with 30 seconds left, they actually take the lead 71 to 70. So Kobe takes the ball. He dribbles down the court. He hits a shot with 11 seconds left that I think this shot will be remembered forever because Kobe's the greatest and this shot was epic. But actually what ends up happening over the next 11 seconds is what will be remembered forever. And here's what happened. Watch this. Ginobili will inbound to Duncan. He gets doubled, Shaq all over him. He gets away, a fadeaway. He makes it with four tenths left. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Four tenths remaining in the fifth game. Here they go. They get it to Fisher. He scores! Oh, Gary God Fisher God. scores at the buzzer. We got to take a look at it, but I got to tell you live, it looked good. You know, at the risk of being a shill, now I know why they say, we love this game. We love this game. What a, it's just unbelievable. Two incredibly ridiculous shots, okay? Tim Duncan hits a shot over Shaq that should be remembered forever. And to that point, I don't think there had ever been a shot hit with .4 seconds left on the clock. So everyone's thinking, this game is over. But now, if there's a close game in the playoffs, in the finals, I'm waiting until the buzzer actually sounds because even if there's 0.4 left, my team may still win. 
It's really interesting because you see the extreme emotions in all the Spurs fans in that stadium. They're thinking, there's no way that they are going to be able to come back from this. They're cheering. They're thinking, we just won game five. And then Derek Fisher does the unthinkable. So why do we love moments like that? Because I think there's something at the core of us. There's something inside you and I that says, I want my life to count. I want my shot to count, right? And why do we say things like that? I want my shot to count. I want my life to count. We say things like that because that's what's going on on the inside of us. That's what attaches us to things like sports. And think about it. When you were growing up, I remember me and my dad, we'd be play, playing basketball in the driveway. We were never reenacting the first quarter. We were never reenacting a game that didn't matter. We were always reenacting all or nothing. The stakes are high. Win, we get to bring home the trophy. It was always those types of matchups. It was always that that we loved. And ultimately, honestly, whether you're competitive or not, whether you're young or you're old in here this morning, in a moment of vulnerability, I think we would all come to the conclusion. We could all say, that, yeah, like I, I want my life to count. Yeah, I, I want to contribute something to the world that matters. Yeah, I, I want to add value. I want my shot to count. I want my life to count. And, and this premise, this position, this hope, is, it's nothing new. In fact, it's been around since like ancient days, since Bible days. And what I want to do today is I want to unpack for us one story that Jesus told and then one conversation that Jesus had that points to this idea of greatness. So one story that Jesus told and then one conversation that Jesus had, ultimately all of this with this hope that we would walk away being reminded that there is greatness for us to live out today. So if you do have a Bible and you want to follow along, you can feel free to do that. Otherwise, it will be up here on the screen. Feel free to follow along that way. And I love saying this, but if you're here and you don't have a physical Bible and you want one, just go over out to the info center after service. We would love to get you one. Okay, let's pick up this story. This is a story Jesus told. It's found in Matthew 25, starting in verse 14. Here's how it reads. It says this, it's like a man going off on an extended trip. He called his servants together and he delegated responsibilities. To one, he gave $5,000, to another, $2,000, and to a third one, $1,000, depending on their abilities. And then he left. Right off, the first servant went to work and doubled his master's investment. The second did the same, but the man with a single thousand dug a hole and carefully buried his master's money. Now, time out before we go on. In this translation that we're reading, it says one got $5,000, one $2,000, and another one $1,000. In other uh, texts, it would say it as talents. And all that, that, that means is that there's a difference in currency. So one gets five talents, one gets two talents, and one gets one talent. Or we can do it in thousands, right? And what I initially notice, and what's so intriguing, and honestly kind of rubs me the wrong way, is that Jesus begins to have this conversation and say, yeah, like some of you feel like you have five and others of you feel like you have two and yet others of you feel like you have one. And he doesn't go into a long dialogue about it, but he just says, yeah, that's life. Sometimes life is unfair and sometimes you feel like you've been handed more and sometimes you feel like you've been handed less. And in this case, the master hands out five to one and two to another and one to another and then the story goes on. Now, with that in mind, as we read on, it's intriguing. But look, T today, I, as we're looking at this scripture, I, I also find this intriguing, that, that there, there's three guys, and each guy could have gotten three talents, right? Or you could have just focused on the one guy who didn't invest his money wisely, but instead, Jesus chooses to do something totally different in this story. So you have this guy with 5,000, and he goes and doubles it. You have a guy with two, he goes out and doubles it, and a guy with one who just buried his money. What's about to happen? Let's pick it up, verse 19. After a long absence, the master of those three servants came back and settled up with them. The one given $5,000 showed him how he had doubled his investment. His master commended him. Good work. You did your job well. From now on, be my partner. The servant with 2,000 showed how he had also doubled the master's investment. His master commended him. Good work. You did your job well. From now on, be my partner. And growing up, I heard this all the time. But what would happen is they would like fast forward to the last servant. 
all the preachers that I heard growing up, and I heard a lot of preachers because I was a pastor's kid, and I'm still in counseling for it, okay? Three sessions a week. But I heard this story, I heard this story a lot. And they would always press the fast forward button to talk about the last servant who buried his treasure. And I think Jesus was a great storyteller. And if he only wanted to tell us about one servant who went and buried his treasure, he would have done that. But instead, he includes two guys in this story. And he says that they were faithful and that they doubled the investment that the master made into their life. Which means that I think there was something important about what these servants chose to do. They took what the master gave them and they made more with it. They took what the master put in their hands and they said, I will go and I will double this investment. And check it out, the response to the guy with 5,000 who doubles and comes back with 10,000, the guy with 2,000 who makes it 4,000, Jesus' response, it's actually copy and paste. The master's response is copy and paste. Hey, good job. You did your job well. Come and be my partner. Another translation puts it this way. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. It's interesting. If the focal point is to be placed on the last servant, then why include these first two and start to show this rhythm? Okay, these guys are faithful with little. It doesn't matter if you have five or you have two, but if you work to double your investment, the master's saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Hey, come share in the master's happiness. So this would uh, beg us to believe that if the guy with one had just gone out, invested the one, had worked to double his one and make it two, the master's response would have been the same. But that's not how the end of this story goes. I think when we look at these first two, we realize that we are to stretch and we are to grow and we are to sweat and we are to toil because hard work is good work when it's done with a purpose and when it's done for God. And what Jesus is setting up is he's saying, you want to be someone that I come to and I say, well done, good and faithful servant? Then be faithful with with what I've placed in your hands. Whether it's five or it feels like two or it feels like one. And he sets up this rhythm in this story. See, I, I want a life of meaning. I want a level of supernatural happiness, even as this story refers to it as. I want to know that the master looks at me and says, well done, good and faithful servant. I want a taste of that. And my hope for us this morning is that our eyes would be so fixed on the goodness of Jesus that it would lead us to live lives of greatness. And I think these first two servants were great. My hope, my prayer is that our eyes would be so fixed on the goodness of Jesus that it leads us to lives of greatness. So to the servant with five, he makes it ten. To the servant with two, he goes out, he works hard, and he gets four. And now we pick up the story again in verse 24. Here's how it reads. The servant given 1,000 said, Master, I know you have high standards, and you hate careless ways, that you demand the best, and you make no allowances for error. I was afraid I might disappoint you. So I found a good spot, a good hiding place, and secured your money. Here it is, safe and sound, down to the last cent. The master was furious. That's a terrible way to live. It's criminal to live cautiously like that. If you knew I was after your best, why did you do less than the least? The least you could have done uh, would have been to invest the sum with the bankers, where at least I would have gotten a little investment or a a little interest. Take the thousand, give it to the one who risked the most, and get rid of this play it safe who won't go out on a limb. Throw him out into utter darkness. And I think this story begs a question to you and I this morning. That question is, what is God given that we've hidden? What's God given that you've hidden? See, to some, we look around and we start saying, wow, that person looks like they have two. That person looks like they have five. And I just got this measly little one. What what has God given us that we've chosen to hide? And and look at the mentality of this servant with 1,000. I I wonder if the reason he, he buried it wasn't because he was a bad guy, but just because he was really afraid. Or he was really nervous. 
And he was like, man, I, I look around and I see other people that just, it feels like they can do more than me. It feels like they can be better than me. And, and I, I just, I, I don't want to lose the master's money. I, I don't want to invest it wrong. I don't, I don't want to come back and, and have less than what I was given. So I'm just going to risk nothing. I'm just going to do nothing with it. I'm going to bury it and I'm going to come back with the exact same amount after the master comes back from his trip. And look at the master's response. He says, wait, really? Really, you didn't do anything with it? See, I, I think this story shows that playing it safe actually dishonors God. Playing it safe does not honor God. And in fact, I would go so far to say that when we, out of fear, we refuse to use the investment that God has placed in us and in our hands, and he says, use this talent, use this time, use this resource that I've placed and given to you, that we are actually limiting God's favor in our lives when we choose not to use it, when we choose not to go out and work, that we could actually be the own, our own lid on our spirituality and on our spiritual journey, and on what we would see in our life. And so, if we believe that playing it safe doesn't honor God, that maybe our mind needs to begin to shift, right? But it's like some of us, we have this thousand, and so we pick up our shovel, and we say, man, everyone else has more, and we dig. Man, I, I, this isn't enough, God. And we dig. Say, uh, you know what? Maybe I'll do this. Maybe I'll go bury it. Have you ever done this before? I, I've been there. You, you, you think, uh, oh, I, I'll just go bury it and I'll come back later and hope it's more. I'll go and I'll hope and I'll pray that God will just give me more. And when the 1,000 turns to 5,000, I'll go back, grab it, and then I'll start doing great things for God. But he's saying, it doesn't matter if you have 5,000. It doesn't matter if you have 2,000. It doesn't matter if you have 1,000. It's about what you do with what's in your hands right now. I've been the third servant. I've been the guy that said, man, like, God, this isn't enough. Would you just give me more and then I'll use it? Would you just give me more and then I'll use it? Reality is, and what this story is asking us is, will we choose to invest and grow and risk and expand what we've been given? Because that's why we were given it in the first place. In fact, there's multiple other scriptures that murmur this exact same sentiment. There's, there's other places in the New Testament that get at this exact same theme. I'll point out two to you right now. The first one is in Galatians chapter 6, verse 4 and five, one of my favorite passages of scripture, it reads like this, make a careful exploration of who you are and the work that you have been given and then sink yourself into that. Don't be impressed with yourself. Don't compare yourself with others. Each of you must take responsibility for doing the creative best you can with your own life. Another passage of scripture that I love, Ephesians 2 verse 10 it reads like this, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Here's some talent. Here's some time. Here's some resource. How will you invest it? How will you grow it? How will you use it? And what I see over and over again in scripture is that Jesus calls people towards greatness. Look at the life of Peter. Peter. He says, you are the rock on which I will build my church. To others of his friends, to others of his disciples, what does he say? He says things like, hey, you were fishermen, and now I will make you fishers of men. I will make you leaders. I will make you leaders of leaders. He's saying, take a step. He's saying, there's, there's more to do. There's more to be done. There's more purpose. There's more value to be had. Take a step. He's calling out Greatness, time and time again. Live life to the full. Be great, be great, be great. So will you be faithful with what God has given you or are you burying it and hoping for more? See, I actually think, uh, you know, we, we talk about this story Jesus told. There's also this conversation Jesus had that, that is also extremely compelling and I wanna look at that over the next few 
minutes. Sometimes I think we have the wrong perspective on this story, but it it reads like this in, in Matthew chapter 20, starting in verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. Now wait, earlier, these sons are referred to by this nickname. The Sons of Thunder. WWE duo, right? Like that's exactly what I think of. I'm extremely visual. So here's what I'm picturing. Big burly dudes, lots of tattoos, really good sized beer gut. They're wearing a lot of leather. They got really huge, gnarly, awesome beards. Everyone's like taking pictures with them, right? Like Undertaker, maybe huge, those types of dudes. Okay, what does this verse say? They come to Jesus with mommy. That's what it says. They come to Jesus with their mom and they have their mom ask, a, ask this question of Jesus. Where they're hiding behind mommy. Okay, go, 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 go. Say your line, say your line. I don't know how it will work out for you, but I know uh, if I went to Dan's office tomorrow and I said, hey, Dan, I really, uh, and I'm too nervous, so I call my mom. I send my mom into my, my, uh, to Dan, my boss's office. Say, my mom goes in, she says, hey, my son's been doing a great job. Um, I think you should give him a raise. <laughs> Dan is a pastor, and I would still be the laughing stock of this church, okay? He would laugh at me. He would make fun of me. He would ridicule me because I sent mommy to ask for my pay raise. But these aren't just normal men. These are the sons of thunder. And they're hiding behind mommy because they're too afraid to ask this of Jesus. But you kind of have to commend her, right? Because she's about to ask something of him. There's a favor that she wants. And so check this out. They go, Mom, like we rehearsed. Jesus says, what do you want? She says, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. And Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. So uh, uh, applaud this mom for a second because she wants great things for her kids. And she sees the greatness in Jesus, and she says, I want my sons to be as close to you as possible. She says, you have a kingdom, and I want my sons to be powerful in that kingdom. She says, you have a left side and a right side. Let one of my sons sit at your left. Let one of my sons sit at your right. But what's interesting is Jesus uses this line. He says, can you drink of this cup? This kind of obscure line. And what he's getting at is he saying, do you understand what it actually takes to be great in my kingdom? Because you see the powers and the authorities of this world, and you see how political figures lord over their people. You see how leaders in this world use their power for evil or for whatever they want. And I've come to set up a new kingdom where the way down is the way up, and I don't think you know what you're asking for when you ask for your sons to be great. She says, Jesus, one on your left, one on your right, please. And Jesus is saying, are you ready to carry the weight of sacrifice necessary to be great in God's kingdom? Are you ready to carry the weight of sacrifice that's necessary to be great in God's kingdom? See, Jesus is the greatest man who ever lived because he made the greatest sacrifice ever made. And in his kingdom, the level of greatness is determined by the level of sacrifice. So Jesus is saying, are you willing to make that level of sacrifice? Do you even realize? See, I think some of us, we've fallen victim to thinking once we become Christians, the five just magically becomes ten. But no, God's placed something in your life and he's begging you to use it. He's saying, what will you do with this investment I've given you, with this calling I've put on your life, with this purpose I've already placed in you? Go and double the investment. Are you ready to carry that weight of sacrifice that that level of greatness demands? So here's what happens. That conversation with the sons of thunder and mommy happened. And then the word gets out, okay? We're gonna pick up this story in verse 24. It says this, when the 10 heard about this, this is the other 10 disciples, they were indignant, they were mad, they were annoyed. 
with these two brothers. And so Jesus called them together, and he said, like any good leader would, right? He doesn't want unity to break. He doesn't want their momentum to break. And here's what he says to them. He says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great. What did Jesus just say? Whoever wants to become great. Whoever wants to become great. Now, I don't know about you, but as soon as I hear this, my ears perk up. And here's why. Because I want to be great. Because I want my shot to count. Because I want my life to matter. Because I don't want to live mundane. Because I don't want to just slide by. And so Jesus says, I want, do you want to be great? And I say, yes, Jesus, and whatever you say next only applies to me. Forget everyone else in the room because I want to be great. And there's some people in this room, and I'm speaking specifically to because there's people in this room that you know that you're called to do something great, that you're called to more than what your life has been so far, that it feels mundane and it feels average and it feels like you're just sliding by. So listen if that's you. He says, do you want to be great? And see, so many Christians, we get into our Christian faith and we think what we're about to hear next is, if you want to be great, give up greatness because you're be you've become a Christian. And that's not what Jesus does. If he wants to stomp out their greatness, he would do it right here. And that's not what he says at all. Check out what he says next. Whoever wants to become great among you must be the servant. He says this. He says, if you don't want to be great, then this doesn't even apply to you. If you're in here this morning and you're cool with sliding by, then don't worry about being a servant. Then don't worry about sacrifice. But if you're in here this morning and something touches your heart and something makes your ears perk up when you hear that, and you're saying, yeah, Benji, my life has to count. My shot, it has to count. It has to matter. Then the way down is the way up. And the way that the world's doing it, where they lord over people, it's not the way. Jesus is saying, I'm showing you the true path to greatness. I'm showing you the way forward. And it looks a lot like sacrifice. And it looks a lot like becoming a humble. See, Jesus never, ever called you to give up your ambition. He called you to give up your ego. He never called you to give up your ambition. He never called you to give up your calling. He's placed more purpose and more passion on the inside of us to do things in this life that matter, that count. But he's asking you, will you do it humbly? Will you do it without an ego? Will the way up be the way down for you? Because that's when you get to share in the master's happiness. Whoever wants to be great, that's me. Before Jesus even gets the word great fully out of his mouth, I have both hands raised. I'm saying, that's me. I want to be great, Jesus. And serve. It goes on. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, Jesus is saying, I've already set this example for you. Just follow in this way this morning. He's saying the level of greatness will be measured by the level of sacrifice. Jesus is the greatest man who ever lived because he made the greatest sacrifice ever made. He's asking you, are you willing to join in that story this morning? See, we all want greatness, but that doesn't mean we're great. I want to be a great chef. That doesn't make me a good cook. I want to be a great athlete. That doesn't make me the next Kobe Bryant. I want to be spiritually mature. That doesn't make me spiritually mature. I want to be fully alive, but that doesn't mean I'm living fully. We all want lots of things, but are we taking steps towards those things? Or is it all just staying in that want category? My hope, my prayer, my ambition with this morning's conversation is that we would realize that the greatest of all time is Jesus and that we follow in his way and that in order for us to attach our lives to greatness, it's going to take a lot of sacrifice, hard work, determination. My prayer is that we would grow some 
grit that when life gets hard and you want to quit, you don't give up. You grow some grit. You keep pushing forward. Let that be the pain of training that in, that creates endurance in you. I'm begging you, don't act like your life doesn't matter. Don't act like your shot doesn't count. In fact, 1 Corinthians puts it this way, run in such a way to win the prize. Run in such a way to win the prize. Run like your life matters because it does. Run like your life matters because it does. Run like your shot actually counts because it does. I would go so far to say that being average isn't spiritual. Because where you are now, God sees you and he loves you, but he always calls you to take another step. He always calls you towards the next level of greatness. He's always calling you to drop your current ego and pick up ambition in a new way. I don't think being average is spiritual. I think we need to grow some grit. So three questions as we close. One, what would it look like for you to invest all that God has placed in you? Two, what's a step that you can take towards using your talent to serve? And three, what would it look like for you to run to win? See, I believe that this church, Icon Church, should be a church that's full of the best teachers. That should be a, we should be a church that's full of the best musicians. We should be a church that's full of the best plumbers. We should be a church that's full of the best workers, the best bosses, the best leaders. We should be a church that is striving to be as great as we possibly can because what we're doing actually matters. And if you want your life to count, I believe you're with me this morning, then the best thing we can do in response is leave here and be the greatest version of who God asked us to be. And some of you, you feel like you have five. And some of you, you feel like you have two. And some of you, you feel like you have one. But the response is the same to each of us, that when we're faithful and we choose to double what God's placed in our lives, he'll count it as faithfulness to us. He'll say, well done with a little, here's more. Share in your master's happiness. Be my partner. Don't act like your life doesn't matter because it does. Don't act like your work doesn't matter because it does. Can we do this together? Can we go ahead and stand? I'm going to pray for us. We're going to sing one last song. God, I thank you for every person in this room, every person within the sound of my voice. And when I start speaking on this topic of greatness, I believe there's people in this room this morning that they're saying, yeah, that's me. God, I want to be great. And I know it's weird to say that in church because I feel like sometimes we have to act like we want fourth place, but we don't, God, this morning. We're saying we want to be the best version of us that we could possibly be. And we see in scripture that it's not about us losing our ambition. It's about us losing our ego. So God, strip us of our pride, but may we be the best version. May we invest all we have, all our time, all our talents, all our energy for this one cause, that you would be made famous through us and that we would get to be your partners in the world, that we would realize that our shot counts, that our life counts, that you're pouring purpose into us, that you're calling us to take new levels of risk. God, you're changing our hearts and our mentality and you're reminding us that greatness doesn't look like what the rest of the world thinks greatness looks like, but that actually greatness looks a whole lot like serving. God, will we figure out ways to use our gifts to serve? And when people see us, would they actually glorify you in heaven? Because you're the greatest. We love you. In your name we pray. Everyone said, amen. As this last song plays, there's going to be prayer teams on the side. If you want prayer for anything, whether it's regarding my message or